This is the Capital Rundown. We have the former president on one side promoting these candidates and the DeVos family and others on the other, and we're going to see who wins. I think it's really important to talk about what we want to do to make Michigan a family-friendly state. Regardless of what we look like or where we live, everyone will have unfettered access to the ballot box. It's all straight ahead. The Capitol Rundown starts now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Siobhan Klepfer. The clock is ticking. Early voting has already started and we're just over two weeks from the August 2nd primary when people will vote in person and clerks across the state of Michigan will count the ballots. Then we'll know which Republican will face incumbent Democrat Gretchen Whitmer this fall. And we've got the results of a poll out this week that gives us a snapshot of that race. It shows Tudor Dixon in the lead with just over a quarter of the vote. That's 11% more than her closest competitor. Ryan Kelly is in Second with 15%, Kevin Rinke and Garrett Soldano are tied for third with 13% each, and Ralph Reband picked up just 1%. But there's a reason those numbers don't add up to 100%, and that's because 33% of Republican voters say they still don't know who they'll vote for. So while Dixon has a solid lead, the race is still up for grabs. The poll by Mitchell Research and Communications, conducted on July 7th and 8th, has a margin of error of plus or minus 3.75%. And speaking of, Tudor Dixon, the Capitol Rundown, had a chance to sit down and speak with her about what she wants to do as governor. We tackle education, guns, and abortion, and she also laid out what she wants to see the future of business look like in our state. We're at a crucial step of getting kids back on track because in Michigan we had students out of school longer than most other states. So what can we do to make sure that we're not behind? As you know, those literacy exams came back and we've got half of our third graders that are failing the literacy exams. So it means we need to get people caught up. I really want to look at what we can do to harden our schools and provide safety resource officers, make sure that our schools are safe. When we look at gun regulation, it's never been effective. You, I mean, if you just look back at what happened in Chicago, they, they have gun control, they have red flag laws, and that didn't prevent this from happening. So why don't we put our kids in a situation where we know they are safe? And so far, we don't have anybody talking about this. Even when the governor is asked what you're going to do about making sure our kids are safe in school, her response is always, we should have a discussion about it. What is that discussion? We have a 2018 safe schools plan. That hasn't been implemented. Had that it been implemented, we might have seen something different happen in the Oxford situation. We've got to make sure that we are focusing on our kids when they're in school, that that school is safe. We are not going to infringe on our Second Amendment. We are going to make sure that people are safe and, and that when we see mental health issues, that they're taken care of, that we're not going to look the other way and say, well, this is, this is not my problem, that we're going to take into account that 2018 school safety law, the okay to say, make sure that people know when we see a problem, we take care of that problem. Trying to gather up weapons has absolutely never worked. A life is a life to me. A life is a life. And it's important to protect life. And I'm a mom. I've had babies. I've felt that first moment of feeling life inside of me. That moment that you feel life and your body is changing, that life is valuable. Businesses are being driven out of the state by state government. And if you're a business owner or a person with a family and you want to have a job, we want to make sure that this is a business friendly state and that we're driving companies here instead of across the border. I think it's really important to talk about what we want to do to make Michigan a family friendly state. And that is that we want to create safe communities first and foremost. We have a lot of dangerous cities in this state. In fact, we're on the top 100 list in many different areas. So we want to reduce that and make sure we have safe cities. And I think that's something that we can all agree upon. And now we're going to check in with Kier Lake and Capitol correspondent Tim Skubik. They tackle a couple of topics, including a clash between two political titans that's playing out here in Michigan. Tim, as always, thank you so much for joining us. And first, let's talk about inflation. It's taking a toll on families around Michigan and across the nation. We're spending more on food, gas, and things we need to get by each day. But you found out this could actually help Michigan schools. Can you explain how that works? 
Yeah, there's. If you were looking for a silver lining, it's a very thin one, but it's a, it's an interesting uh, sort of spin-off story from the pain that people are are feeling at the pump and elsewhere, as you just suggested, with inflation at a 40-year high at 9.1 percent. But here's what's happened in the state of Michigan: as a result of more sales tax being collected all across the spectrum, the state government is now bringing in more money than it anticipated. What they do is every month they make a guess at how much revenue revenue is coming in. Well, last month they were off. They were off on their estimate by $1.1 billion with a B. They missed that. You know, that's not even that is that's not even close for government work. They were so far off. And so what happened in June is that they collected $1 billion on the state sales tax. And a lot of that goes to Michigan schools. So Basically, yeah, we're paying more for the stuff we're buying, but the state is benefiting, and so are school kids. And to put it in perspective, to the year for the year to date so far, inflation has helped to produce a sales tax collect collection in Michigan. I've checked this number out: six point nine billion dollars. That's up eighteen percent over last year. All right, Tim, and turning now to Michigan politics. Among Republicans, the DeVosses are the first family in Michigan. One ran for governor and another used to run the party, but they seem to be butting heads with a former first family, this one named Trump. What's happening there? Yeah, this is an interesting story. Donald Trump uh, has gotten his uh, political nose into races in the Michigan House. He has endorsed eight Trump backed candidates who are running for the Michigan House. Firstly speaking, the DeVos family is also funding seven of those candidates. So we have an interesting, interesting matchup. We have the former president on one side promoting these candidates and the DeVos family and others, and they got a lot of them in this, in this state, on the other, and we're going to see who wins. Uh, a lot of money being spread around by the two families. The point here is that the DeVos family is not too happy with Donald Trump, as witnessed by the fact that Betsy DeVos, who was the education secretary for the former president, actually had a private meeting in which she talked about invoking the 25th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution to get Mr. Trump out of office for the conduct that he was undertaking. She didn't like it. And obviously, Mr. Trump is not happy with her. So you have these two parties and these two families butting heads. And when we count the votes, uh, we'll find out who won. All right, Tim, as always, we appreciate it so much. And thank you, Kira and Tim. Coming up next on The Rundown, we're not just talking about the candidates. We'll tell you about two initiatives that will likely end up on your ballot in November and how they might affect voter turnout. That's when the Capital Rundown returns. Welcome back. This past Monday was the deadline for groups to turn in their petitions to get their issues on the November ballot, and there were two groups with a lot of signatures. They each needed to turn in about 425,000 to qualify, but the petition drive by Reproductive Freedom for All turned in more than 750,000. They say that's a record. The group wanted to show how much support it has and fend off potential challenges by groups who might want to spar over signatures. The cushion of more than 300,000 means they'll almost certainly make the ballot. And if passed by voters, it would enshrine the right to birth control, prenatal care, and yes, access to abortion in the Michigan Constitution. Abortion access is being threatened after the Supreme Court's recent ruling overturning Roe versus Wade. I shouldn't be here today, but I am. I am over 60 years of age, and my rights as a woman, as a human being, has been ripped away from me and 167.5 other million women in this country. Meanwhile, a group called Promote the Vote turned in almost 670,000 signatures for their initiative, and it would give voters nine days of early in-person voting have the state pay for postage for absentee applications and ballots and require secure ballot drop boxes and an absentee ballot tracking system, among other changes. Supporters say they want Michigan elections to be as accessible and secure as well as free and fair. Promote the vote ensures 22 ensures the election results are determined based on the votes of Michigan citizens, regardless of the, what candidate or political party you may support.
And regardless of what we look like or where we live, everyone will have unfettered access to the ballot box. Each petition drive is, of course, dedicated to a particular issue, but could ballot initiatives help drive people to the polls who might have stayed home? We asked our Capitol correspondent Tim Skubik for his thoughts. The popular wisdom in town, which sometimes is wrong at this read, is this is good news for the Democrats will be geeked, particularly women in the suburbs and elsewhere who want to make sure that abortion is legal in Michigan and they are expecting the Democrats, they're expecting these women in particular to show up in droves to support this amendment. Also on the election issue, this could be a little closer. Both Democrats and Republicans are divided on this. That one could be a wash, but clearly on the abortion issue, you can expect, at least the pollsters are saying, a greater turnout on both sides to resolve that issue when it does appear on the November ballot for you to decide. All right, thanks again, Tim. Coming up, we'll talk about upending a tradition. Iowa has always gone first when picking presidential candidates, but could that switch to Michigan? That debate when the Capitol Rundown returns. Since the 1970s, the presidential selection process has started with the Iowa caucuses, but that could change, at least for Democrats. Natalie Brand talks about a potential change in the lineup and why we could move to the front of the line. Just meetings across the Since 1972, the first test of presidential hopefuls has started with Iowa, a campaign trail that winds through the state fair, rural farmland, and of course, caucus night. All of our representatives are currently busy. But after 2020's caucus chaos, the Democratic National Committee is considering shaking up the schedule. And 16 states plus Puerto Rico are vying for the honor, with state officials traveling to D.C. to make their pitches before the DNC's Rules and Bylaws Committee. We're ready to be first. Nevada, currently third on the calendar, is one of the states making a big play to move to the head of the line. I just feel like Nevada has the edge. Nevada Democratic Party Chair Judith Whitmer argues the state offers battleground competitiveness and diversity, especially among key and growing voting blocks of Latino and Asian American Pacific Islanders, in addition to unions. We have to make sure that all those voices are represented and all those voices are heard. Midwestern states, including Minnesota and Michigan, are also battling to replace Iowa. You don't win the White House unless you win Michigan. No matter which state lands in that coveted first spot, George Washington University professor Laura Brown says it's really the first few contests that can make or break a presidential campaign taking on more weight than maybe they should. They create a momentum, they create a message that the party has decided and they've decided very quickly when really the parties would be better served by a calendar that was longer and a process that engaged more people. But it will be no more than five states that hold their contest before the first Tuesday in March, raising the stakes for those deciding the calendar. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Washington. A vote by the Democratic National Committee's Rules Committee is expected in August with a final vote before the full DNC in September. When we come back, we are going to take you to the nation's capital and we'll catch you up on the latest hearing by the January 6th committee. We'll be right back. We've learned new details this week about the attack on the U.S. Capitol. The January 6th committee accused former President Trump of inciting the violence and brought witnesses and evidence to make their case. Hannah Brandt has the highlights. At Tuesday's hearing, the committee laid out new evidence showing former President Trump knew he lost the 2020 election. Donald Trump cannot escape responsibility by being willfully blind. The committee shared details of a tense and chaotic Oval Office meeting in December of 2020 that led to President Trump tweeting to encourage his supporters to come to Washington on January 6th, writing, it will be wild. To tweet that would galvanize his followers, unleash a political firestorm, and change the course of our history as a country. Committee members say the president's call inspired a flurry of planning from right-wing extremists. Calling on we, the people, to take action and to show our numbers. These degenerates in the deep state are going to give us what we want 
or we are going to shut this country down. For the first time, the committee showed evidence, including internal messages, that showed former President Trump planned in advance to call on ralliers to march on the Capitol. This was not a spontaneous call to action, but rather was a deliberate strategy decided upon in advance by the president. Capitol rioter Stephen Ayers says he and others were motivated by the former president's instructions. We got everybody riled up, told everybody head on down. So we basically were just following what he said. And former Oath Keeper Jason Van Tatenhove says January 6th had the potential to be even worse. This could have been the spark that started a new civil war. In Washington, I'm Hannah Brandt. The committee is scheduled to meet again on Thursday night, and for the second time so far, this meeting is once again scheduled for the evening in prime time. Still to come, we're going to tell you about one of Michigan's newest residents, who, as it turns out, has some pull in Washington, D.C. We'll also tell you what he was doing in his new home state this week. That's when the Capitol Rundown continues. We learned this week about one of Michigan's newest residents. His name is Pete Buttigieg. The one-time presidential candidate is officially a Michigander. He moved here because his husband's family is from Traverse City. Well, of course, he's better known today as the U.S. Secretary of Transportation, and it's in that capacity that he was in Michigan this week. He helped announce a multi-million dollar grant to update the Ford International Airport in Grand Rapids. It's one of several grants that will improve airport access across the state and help ease the airline struggles that we've been hearing about for the past few weeks. Today, when you look at global rankings of great airports, not a single airport in the United States ranks among the world's top 25. And we feel those shortcomings too often flying through terminals that need a lot of work. And now we are in a position to fix that. And if you're interested in getting some more political news from Michigan and Washington, we've got just the thing. You can sign up for our Capital Rundown newsletter. It's just one email each week, and you can get it by pointing your cell phone camera at the screen right now. That will take you to the sign up page, or you can head to WLNS.com slash newsletters. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching the Capital Rundown.